everyone, and welcome to our discussion of American Founders with Christina, Dr. Christina Prenza coles We're so excited to have you here and to discuss this awesome book. Before we begin, I will introduce our speakers and the book we will be discussing. Uh, Chris, Dr. Christina Prenza coles it holds a dual doctorate in sociology and history from the New School for Social Research. She's been a lifelong student of American culture and history while living and working in Miami, New York, Havana, and Charlottesville. From 2004 to 2011, she was an assistant professor of the Atlantic World slash African diaspora at Virginia State University. Her ancestors include daughters of the Revolution, American Revolution, Portuguese conversos, Cuban pirates, a Confederate sergeant, and a governor of Alabama. American Founders reveals men and women of African descent as key protagonists in the story of American democracy. It chronicles how black people developed and defended the new world settlements, undermined slavery, and championed freedom throughout the Americas from the 16th through the 20th century. I'm Olivia Horvath. I am a digital services specialist with the Prince George's County Memorial Library System, and I'm so exciting, excited to be co-hosting this discussion with uh, my good friends Renee Battlebrooks and Kyla Hannington from uh, the, um, the Prince George's County Office of Human Resources. And so if you've joined us before, uh, you know all of our friends there. Uh, but if not, I will introduce you to them. Renee Battlebrooks is the executive director of the Prince George's County Office of Human Rights, formerly the Prince George's County Human Relations Commission. New name, same great friends, great work. Pr prior to joining OHR in late 2018, Ms. Battlebrooks served as an assistant state's attorney for 19 years and a public defender for eight years. In addition to her work for the residents of Prince George's County, Ms. Battlebrooks is an accomplished violinist who plays around the world, which is awesome. I'm glad she could take the time to be with us today. And our uh, dear friend, Kyla Hannington, is the outreach coordinator and public information officer for the Office of Human Rights. She's also a big champion for the library um, and collaborates uh, with us in all sorts of author discussions and other exciting events. So uh, without further ado, uh, give it up for the three of these wonderful ladies and uh, let's uh, hear what everyone has to say. Awesome, thank you so much for that, Olivia. First of all, my prop, everyone should go and purchase, oh, yep, should purchase this book, American Founders. We are thrilled to have with us the author, um, and so, you know, before we begin, Dr. Christina, um, perhaps if you have a presentation, we would love, we would love for you to set the background for that. Thank you. And thank you for having me. And um, I'm always so excited to have the opportunity to talk about American founders, um, how people of African descent established freedom in the new world. And this is a project that originated when I was teaching at um, Virginia State University. And every year I taught courses like United States history, world history, Latin American history. And every year as I researched and updated the syllabi, I kept coming across the stories of these just remarkable things that African descended men and women had done in the course of American history. Uh, men and women who had uh, started independence movements, um, men and women who had fought in revolutions, started schools, newspapers, businesses, political parties. Um, people who had innovated technology and medicine, people who had risked their lives and given their lives for the establishment of freedom in the new world. And cumulatively, the number of individuals I came across in historical records was overwhelming. And they just, they fundamentally changed how I understand American history and the development of democracy in, in particular. So that's why I wrote American Founders. Um, when I was growing up as a kid, I mean, the impression I was given from history books and popular culture was that African-American history began on 19th century plantations in the South um, and that African-Americans stepped onto the political stage of US history in the 1950s during the civil rights movement. But what I found um, in doing some more research was that you know Africans preceded the English in the Americas by a century. Um, because they accompanied all of the earliest Spanish expeditions and settlements. Um, and also besides that temporal fact, just demographically speaking, 
um, many more Africans came to the New World than Europeans in the beginning of colonial history. In fact, before 1820, three times as many Africans came to the Americas as, as Europeans. And, you know, that is, of course, because of the Atlantic slave trade, which very violently forced some 12 million individuals um, from one continent to another. Um, but to put that ratio another way, you know, one, one, one to three, that means that most Americans arrived in the new world um, as slaves. And so that really kind of changed my, my understanding of, of you know, who, where American history began. And what you could see also see was that um, enslaved people and free people of color were on the forefront of so many struggles to establish towns, to defend rights, um, precisely because often they were denied rights. They were on these forefronts of, of, of movements and efforts to end slavery and discrimination and to put, put the ideals of rights into practice. Um, so not, not starting in the 1950s, starting in the 1500s, um, black men and women did this as you know, litigants in courtrooms, as petitioners of legislative bodies, as, as in rebel um, slaves, as soldiers who both fought um, with the colonial state and sometimes fought against the colonial state as, as clergy, as educators, as journalists, as artists, the list goes on and on. Um, so this is why I wrote American Founders to try to give a chronicle of all of these individuals. I mean, these minimum of African descent were just essentially part of the warp and woof of American history from the most mundane aspects of our history to the most watershed events. And so this slide presentation, I'm gonna give you just a few examples of, of what I mean. So if we could start with the first slide, please. Um, just to start kind of the beginning in the 1500s and 1600s, that African descendant men and women, they played crucial roles in founding the colonial Americas as explorers, conquistadors, as slaves, rebels, maroons, and settlers. So this is an image of Juan Garrido on the far left um, with Cortez in the middle. Juan Garrido was an Afro-Spanish conquistador who arrived in the New World in 1502. Um, and he served with Cortez in missions in Puerto Rico, Florida, and in Mexico, and finally settled in Mexico where he was given the royal appointment of town crier. Um, 1502 is also the same year that the first enslaved Africans arrived in the New World, arriving in Hispaniola, what is today the Dominican Republic um, in Haiti. And according to the Spanish governor of Hispaniola, these individuals immediately ran away and joined with native communities and resisted uh, Spanish plantations. Um, in, very, in fact, the very first reported slave revolt that we know about was comes from the plantation of Christopher Columbus's son in Hispaniola. Um, and there were tons of slave revolts all over Spanish America it, uh, throughout American history. But in the 1500s alone, in a place like what is today Colombia, there were some five slave revolts, I believe, one of which lasted for several months and involved 4,000 individuals. But getting back to Hispaniola for a moment, in the 1540s, there was an outbreak of uh, Hispaniola's Maroon Wars. And so Maroons were self-liberated slaves who formed independent communities um, who were able to defend themselves and often make treaties with colonial powers. And um, anywhere in the Americas that were enslaved communities, Maroon communities also formed. But going back to the beginning of, of Hispaniola's story, these first uh, Maroon Wars began in the 1540s. They lasted for years. And Spanish chroniclers wrote about the bravery of um, African freedom fighters like Lemba, as well as another individual named John Vaquero, which means John Cowboy, because um, many of the first cowboys throughout the New World were of African descent. Um, if you, next slide, please. The next slide is uh, this is the oldest signed and dated painting made in the New World that we know about. Um, it is, uh, these are, it's called the Three Gentlemen of Esmeraldas. It features Don Francisco de Arobe and his sons who ruled over a Maroon community of self-liberated slaves, uh, European missionaries, and native individuals on the coast of Ecuador. It was painted in 1599 and was made by a, um, an artist of, of native descent. And like I said, these Maroon communities formed all over the Americas, from Suriname to Jamaica, to Cuba, to Mexico, to Brazil, to what is today Venezuela, and the United States, um, in places like Virginia and Louisiana, Florida, certainly, um, South Carolina. In fact, the very first permanent settlement in what becomes the United States may have, in fact, been a maroon community. 
1526, a Spanish planter named Ayon. Oh, next slide, please. You can see on this map around the area that is today Georgia that it says Tierra de Ayon. Ayon was a Spanish sugar planter who um, went from Hispaniola and tried to establish a colony, a permanent colony in what becomes North America in 1526. He brought numerous Spanish colonists and, and an unknown number of enslaved African individuals. The colony was a disaster, Ayon died, um, and the colonists either died or returned to Hispaniola, but not before the enslaved individuals mutinied and, um, and ran away, and some believe settled with the native population in Georgia, which would mean that the very first permanent old world settlement in North America began 80 years before Jamestown. Um, next slide, please. We know for sure that Isabel de Olvera preceded the first colonists at Jamestown when she helped to settle what would become New Mexico and what will become the United States. We know this because this is her deposition, a copy of her deposition, which she made in 1600 as she was setting out on an expedition from Mexico to New Mexico. Um, and in this deposition, she attests to her African and her native ancestry and to her free status and insists on her rights as a free person. And what I think is so interesting about this, this deposition from 1600 um, by Isabel Olvera is that it encapsulates several key truths that run, th run through American history and run through American founders. Um, number one is the fact that people of African descent were part of the earliest settlements throughout the Americas, from Santa Fe to St. Augustine, from Los Angeles to New York City, and from Birchtown, uh, Canada to uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina. Second of all, this is another indicator that the civil rights movement did not begin in the 1950s, but that men and women of African descent and their descendants were insisting on rights since the earliest settlements in the 1500s. And third, Isabel de Olvera was of um, mixed ancestry, as would be her children, and she embodies the fact that many, many, many American families are founded on mixed race roots. In fact, the very first recording, recorded Christian marriage in what becomes the United States um, took place in St. Augustine in 1526. And it was a marriage between a free black woman named Luisa de Abrego and a Spanish soldier from Segovia um, named um, Miguel Rodriguez. Um, next slide, please. So African descended men and women, they were instrumental in founding all of the American colonies and all of the American nations. They fought in all of the wars for independence throughout the hemisphere. And essentially, you know, black men fought in every single military engagement um, throughout throughout the Americas. So thousands, this is this is a picture of James Armistead. He's among the thousands of black men who served with the American Patriots during the American Revolutionary War. Um, many, many thousands of, of enslaved and free men of color served with the Patriots. There are also many more tens of thousands um, of enslaved Americans who served with the British during the American Revolution, who served as loyalists as a way to um, achieve freedom. This is why Gary Nash has called the American Revolution one of the largest slave revolts in American history. But back to Mr. James Armistead, he was an enslaved Afro-Virginian who got permission to serve as a double agent um, during the American Revolution. He was working for General Lafayette, but he pretended to be a runaway slave and would infiltrate the camps of Lord Cornwallis and Benedict Arnold and bring intelligence back to General Lafayette. So many have observed that it was this intelligence and Armistead's bravery and his intelligence that allowed um, the maneuvers that led to the victory at Yorktown and American independence. Um, next slide, please. Not only were there uh, men of African descent, uh, African Americans, I should say, who served in the American Revolution. These are Afro Cuban and Afro Mexican soldiers and officers who served with the Patriots in the Panhandle in Florida under the command of Louisiana's Spanish governor. And that shouldn't be surprising because since the earliest um, militias in the Americas, black men served with Spanish, Dutch, French, Portuguese, and English militias starting in, in the earliest times. Um, next slide, please. Also, um, Afro-Haitians served um, alongside the Patriots in the Siege of Savannah. There's a memorial to, to their service um, in downtown Savannah today. This is Henri Christophe, um, who was uh, there at the time, young. He was young during the American Revolution, but he went on to lead the French Revolution. I'm sorry, the Haitian Revolution, which, of course, established the first free republic in the New World. Um, because, of course, the American Revolution 
left one fifth of the American population enslaved, which is why in the decades after the American Revolution, African Americans um, spearheaded so many organizations and efforts to put the ideals of citizenship um, into practice. Next slide, please. So these are just a couple examples, but this is Elizabeth Freeman, who was an enslaved midwife in Massachusetts. Her husband, um, she was the widow of, of a, a enslaved patriot who died in action, was killed in action. She sued for her freedom in a Massachusetts court and won, setting in motion the abolition of slavery in the state of Massachusetts. Next slide, please. This coming up is um, James Horton who, of Philadelphia. He um, was a free sailmaker, but his ancestors, his enslaved ancestors had arrived in Pennsylvania even before Pennsylvania was officially a colony. But James Horton was a free person um, who was a civic leader. He was among the first Americans to hear the public reading of the Declaration of Independence in Philadelphia. He fought in the war and after the war, he um, and his wife became very involved in abolitionist politics and media and he and his wife and their descendants um, continue to fight for the ideals of the American Revolution long after the war. Next slide, please. So in, this, in the late 1700s and early 1800s, black men and women established many anti-slavery and pro-democracy organizations, including newspapers, churches, schools, fraternal organizations, political organizations, um, like the Masonic Lodges, like the Colored Conventions, but also, of course, the Underground Railroad. Um, which not only ran north to Canada, but also ran south to uh, the Caribbean and Mexico. Um, this is a sketch of 15-year-old Anna Maria Weems, and in 1855, after she collaborated with um, agents in the Underground Railroad for two years planning an escape, she went to Washington, D.C. I'm sorry, she went to the White House, um, dressed as a young man, to impersonate a carriage driver at the White House. And that's how she made her escape. She's one of many thousands of, of incredible daring escapes. And in fact, one estimate suggests that some 100,000 Americans liberated themselves through flight in the years between 1810 and, 18, and 1850 alone. Next slide, please. So um, with the arrival of enslaved people in free, sta uh, in free states, um, there was a lot of court cases um, and a lot of endeavors uh, that people tried to um, protect these fugitive slaves. And one of them is this uh, Robert Morris right here. He's a Boston lawyer who um, defended many self-liberated Americans in court against the predations of slave catchers. He also argued for the desegregation of schools a century before Brown versus the Board of Education. Slide, please. So these are John and Mary um, Jones, and they arrived in Chicago in the 1840s carrying free papers, and Mr. Jones was able to establish a tailoring shop. They were very active in the Underground Railroad and in abolitionist politics, and in fact, they housed and dressed John Brown and his crew when they were en route to the Raider University. So this is just a way to say that many, many individuals were involved in the Underground Railroad, both um, freeing themselves and many people were aiding them in this, in this endeavor. And this tide of enslaved people um, leaving the South is you know, among the things that is mentioned as a complaint in the secession documents of the Confederates and helped to instigate the Civil War. And once the Civil War broke out, black men immediately um, tried to enlist just as they had in the American Revolution, just as they had in the War of 1812. Next slide, please. So this is a painting by Eastman Johnson, who was a very famous painter. He's one of the founders of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. He was um, traveling with Union troops in Virginia during the Civil War, and he um, painted this painting of an American family liberating themselves from slavery. And on the back of the painting, it reads, a veritable incident as seen by myself in Centerville. Um, this family just represents one of the many hundreds of thousands of Americans who risked their lives to um, liberate themselves during the Civil War and often went on to fight in the Union for the freedom of others. Um, 200,000 Black Americans served officially as soldiers and sailors and surgeons, and countless others served unofficially, like um, Susie King Taylor. Slide, please. Susie King Taylor had been born enslaved in Georgia, and even though Georgia state law prohibited 
um, the education of enslaved people. She attended underground schools um, where she learned uh, to read and write. It pre prepared her for a career in education. When the war broke out, she served as a volunteer nurse. She cleaned weaponry. Um, and after the war, she established a school. She's just one of many thousands of, of women we could talk about from um, Mary Bowser, who was a, a, a former slave who functioned as a spy in the Confederate um, capital of Jefferson Davis's home. And we could also talk about Harriet Tubman, next slide, um, who was the first woman in American history to lead a military raid. Both her work and that of Mary Bowser, their tactics were praised um, by, by Union generals at the time. Um, you also may know the story of Robert Smalls. N next slide, please. Robert Smalls was an enslaved man in South Carolina, um, a ship's pilot who was able to commandeer a Confederate ship. He boarded his family on this ship along with the, uh, many other enslaved families and um, escaped and delivered the ship to the Union. Robert Smalls continued to serve the Union Navy as a captain for the rest of the war and he was instrumental in trying to push President Lincoln into enlisting these hundreds of thousands of men who are flooding Union lines. Next slide, please. Um, less well known is the story of Robert, I'm sorry, of William Gould. William Gould is seated there in the center. Um, he was an enslaved plasterer in Wilmington, North Carolina, and he and several other enslaved collaborators made an escape along the Cape Fear River for 26 miles, managed to board a Union gunboat. Um, William Gould continued to serve in the Navy for the remainder of the war. And as you can see here, all six of his sons standing behind him went into military service. Um, five of them defended democracy in World War I, and one served with Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders um, in the Spanish-American War to help liberate Cuba from Spain. So this is just to say that, you know, African-Americans were instrumental in every single military engagement, um, every single effort um, to help develop democracy in this country. And African-Americans continued to serve the nation well after the American Civil War, um, despite intense discrimination and the violence of Jim Crow. African-Americans in the 19th century continue to shape U.S. history, not just as soldiers, but also as professionals, um, medical professionals, entrepreneurs, educators, journalists, um, artists, and activists in the early 20th century, even before the beginning of the civil rights movement that we think of in the 1950s, in the first part of the 20th century, African-Americans continued to fight for the ideals um, of the United States in, in their innovations and in academics and law, politics, um, science, engineering, mathematics, medicine, business, journalism, and art. It's a lot, and there's a lot of people in the book, and it's very overwhelming, but I do encourage the reader to let the sheer number of individuals in the book overwhelm us um, and uh, allow us to sort of rethink our national narrative. Um, because I hope that by recognizing the ways in which Black Americans have continuously risked their lives to encourage the U.S. to live up to its founding ideals, and um, also to recognize the countless ways in which men and women of African descent have been absolutely essential to every aspect of American history. It's my hope that that will help us to better appreciate what it means to be American. Thank you, that's my presentation. Thank you. Yeah, that was great. That was. And you know, I just wanna read just a, a short paragraph from your book for those who haven't had the opportunity. But to me, two short things really um, set sort of the background as to why we should care, right? And so you say here, it's really in the last chapter, um, we will not understand American history until we understand African American history and recognize that is not solely a story of oppression, though oppression is a continuous and dangerous current against which people of African descent have had to contend, but also that black people were among the architects of our nation and principal founders of the Americas at large. Black Americans continuously encouraged the United States to live up to the ideals, this is just what you said, enshrined in its founding documents. And then the other thing that you said that struck me, multiculturalism is not politically correct. It is historically accurate. It's like, wow, right? And how did we, how did we get to this place where we, we didn't, none of us, we did not learn our history. We learned sort of this very one-dimensional narrative um, 
And, you know, I'm ashamed that I didn't know this. Um, and we weren't, you know, we weren't taught. And so I wanted to sort of set the, the foundation for explaining some of the terms for people as we discuss. You already explained what maroons were, but manumission, not everybody maybe understand uh, what that is or the term, if you could explain that. That is the legal uh, termination of enslavement for an individual. Um, and one one way I, I use it in the book is you know, I, I mentioned um, James Armistead, who was an enslaved Virginian who eventually got his freedom for his bravery and service um, during the American Revolution. He actually petitioned the Virginia legislature um, specifically and, and, and General Lafayette uh, also um, wrote the legislature and they freed him as an individual act. They manumitted him with an individual act of the legislature. However, I just wanted to point out that so many enslaved patriots served in the American Revolution that Virginia actually created a manumission act in 1783 um, that specifically referred to these enslaved patriots' uh, contributions to the establishment of liberty and independence. Yeah. Can, can you talk to us, you know, we're still on sort of this foundation lane for this conversation, but but really, if you could explain to all of us what made the Atlantic slavery different from any other form in the history, the known history of our world, slavery, what was different and why? Because I've actually had conversations with some that said, oh, well, you know, it wasn't any different from perhaps the uh, the children of Israel enslaved for 400 years under the Egyptian rule. What, what made this so different? Well, you know, slavery begins with the very beginning of, of human civilization. As soon as humans come together in cities, we enslave ourselves. And so in ancient Sumer, the world's first, you know, first civilization, about 50% of the population was enslaved. Um, in ancient Greece, in ancient Rome, in all of the um, ancient worlds, in the Americas, Europe, Africa, and Asia, slavery was a practice. And it had nothing to do with race. Um, this was a period of time when um, people believed in divine right, when people believed in hierarchy, when people believed in a great chain of being. And so the idea that we're all equal and that individuals have equal rights is an extremely new concept. In fact, um, you could say that before 1800, which is pretty recent in terms of world history, before 1800, most individuals on the earth were unfree somehow they, if they they might be enslaved and by the way there were many many you know uh d europeans who were enslaved in different times and places um but you might be a serf you might be an apprentice you might be a concubine and in other words the idea that individuals had had uh had rights is a, is a very very modern concept and that becomes sort of i in my opinion the key to what happens in the new world so um, as I try to outline the beginning of American founders, the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade, it kind of starts off, and this this is, I'm to be clear, I'm synthesizing the work of many, 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 many scholars. And so I'm standing on the shoulder shoulders of so many incredible historians and scholars. I'm, I'm synthesizing their work. So um, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm grateful to them for that. But, you know, the beginning of the Atlantic slave trade, some, some have even described, John Thorne describes it as kind of these beginning expeditions of sort of trial and error as Europeans are trying to figure out how to expand their markets and they're trying to figure out how to get down the coast of West Africa, but nobody can figure out how to get back out. Um, there's a lot of sort of um, contingencies that are happening. There is a, a multinational um, institution of slavery that's happening in Spain and Portugal in these early, early periods before um, coming to the New World. And there are people of African descent living living in in Iberia. What happens, I think, in the New World is this is the and traditionally slavery, you know, it is small scale, or it also might be um, for you know a, a royal. In terms of you heard, you can hear about like Islamic uh, slaveholders who had just you know hundreds and hundreds of slaves who are, I think are sort of examples of conspicuous consumption. They're soldiers, they're tutors, they're cooks, they're musicians, they're entertainers. Um, but the idea of putting Having people mass produce products for a mass market, that's the new thing that happens in the Americas. So when you start to see these beginnings, I mean, literally, if you read, when I was talking about the, the Maroon Wars and Hispaniola and the, and the first enslaved people running away in Hispaniola, there's letters where the king is saying to the governor, treat these people well. Um, you know, we need to care for them because, you know, we're trying to make something here. So but once you introduce in particular sugar, people talk about, I mean, it happens with tobacco and indigo and many other crops, but sugar in particular, um, 
it really requires backbreaking labor, but it also produces profits that are just un, 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 you know, unprecedented in world history that individuals, you know, that the sugar planters can make that much money. Um, so it becomes, you know, the very first mass produced commodity for, for mass consumption. And people, you know, kidnapped people from, from West and West Central Africa become the labor force to produce that sugar that is consumed by, by you know, newly sort of independent workers in, in Europe um, who are no longer producing their own food, who are moving into factories. So you get this kind of cycle. But this idea, as I said, of mass production for mass consumption really turns things into a new world nightmare where it's actually economically um, more, uh, more advantageous to work people to death, which is what happened. Um, and it, uh, you also have a situation where you have, in some cases, um, certainly in sugar colonies and plantation colonies, where you can have massive uh, numbers of enslaved Africans and a very small number of overseers. So the amount of violence required to keep control in that kind of situation is is really stunning and really brutal. So it's, it becomes an incredibly brutal institution um, that becomes the machine, you know, that becomes, and it, it, it undergirds the entire new world, economically, demographically, politically, all of these things are happening. And so, as I mentioned before, if you're, in an, in an old world situation where hierarchy is normal, where different, you know, where where you don't you don't need race to to justify taking someone's labor or someone's land. But the way I see it is that you know when you start to have a discourse of rights and citizenship um, and the Enlightenment and all that stuff, then you start to have to start to explain how do you how do you justify those two systems? How can you have slavery in a democracy? And that's when things get pretty pretty ugly, in my opinion. That there's a lot of physical violence, but also ideological violence that is required to try to keep that system in place. Well, and I could keep talking, but Kyla, go go ahead. I'm sure you have, I, I will muzzle myself. No, for... you don't have me. This is great. I mean, it's just so fascinating. That's what I found about the, the book as I read it. Like it was just every, you know, one of the things that I do when I read books is I end up underlining things I want to remember or talk about. And in your book, it's just page after, I just, and the whole thing. But I did, you know, one of my main questions as I read it, and I think that this is a foundational part of the book, and you've, you talked about it in your introduction, like this, the vast numbers, but it was really, when we see history, and we, and especially when we talk about nation building, it's, it's kind of like great man syndrome, where there's like a, a micro history of one person, and this person's, contra this single person's contribution, and so maybe those like seven people are responsible for this, you know, nation coming out of somewhere. And so obviously this is an extremely different um, way of looking at hi at history in general. And so I was just curious about how you came to to this approach and because obviously it's incredible and what, what led you to it? Well, um, as I said, I kept coming across these stories um, of, of extraordinary things that men and women had done. And so and honestly, I was sort of, I would, I would tell people about it and they'd say, That's, that should be a movie. That should, that should be a book, all these different individuals. And then I had the idea to kind of to put them all into one place, which is kind of hard because there's so many individuals and there, there could be a lot more. And I will, I will tell you, you know, even since its publication, there's many people that I'm like, I wish I could have put them in there. And as I said, I didn't discover all this stuff. I mean, you know, there was, there was an African-American historian, William C. Nell in Boston in, in 1850, who was writing about the Black Patriots, right? So he, this, I'm not inventing this stuff. Like this stuff has been, around, I'm just trying to put it in one place. So, so for me, the idea was, um, if you take all these extraordinary stories that, like I said, are have been hiding in plain sight, and, and I wanna also just give a quick plug, there's so many people that I wrote about that who didn't have biographies about them, but have, since since um, American Founders came out, there's so many great books, like Carrie Greenidge wrote about William um, Monroe Trotter, and Alison Parker has a great book about, um, uh, called Unceasing Militant, um, and I'm also not afraid of the rest of the title of the book. But my point is, all, there, there there weren't as many biographies, I feel like, about some of these individuals. So I wanted to bring them together in one story. And the idea to kind of say, these aren't one-off individuals. These, these aren't exceptions, right? These aren't exceptional stories. This is the rule. Like, if you start to put them all in one place, you start to see how, you know, this is American history. These are our founders. Um, and, you know, I'll certainly say it's, you know, I don't mean it to make it such a such a rosy thing, and I say in the outside of the book that you know I'm assuming the reader has a, a, a decent knowledge of the incredible violence that slavery required. So um, I'm definitely focusing on um, sort of the bright spots of, of the history, and I'm and I'm not focusing on on some of the difficulties. So to give you a quick example, like there's a, a scientist named Percy the Julian 
um, who was, his grandparents were enslaved um, in Alabama, I believe it was, and, and Percival Von Julian loved science and ended up going to, I think it was DePaul University, he wasn't permitted to sleep in the dorms. Um, so he, as I understand it, he actually lived in a fraternity where he cleaned the fraternity house. And he also, but he graduated valedictorian and then he went on to get his PhD, but had trouble because of his, his race getting into PhD program in the United States. So he went abroad as so many um, of these African-American scientists and doctors um, did um, in earlier centuries. And then he comes back to the US and the man invents glaucoma medicine, the medicine that we use today. Mm -hmm. The man invents, he pioneers deriving steroids from plants. Um, he ends up working for Glidden, he ends up, for the paint company, he ends up selling, he's starting his own company, he sells it for millions of dollars in the 60s, he starts a nonprofit. he's an incredible guy. Um, but I don't, when I tell the American founder story, I don't focus on all the negative things, I just kind of focus on the positive things. So um, I, I think it's hard to sort of reconcile all these contradictions. I mean, we're such a fundamental, the whole country, the whole you know con hemisphere is a fundamental contradiction, it's slavery and freedom. Um, it's these incredible achievements and these incredibly, you know, um, difficult uh, pasts. But um, I, I really, you know, I was, I was on a panel once with somebody else who, a, a great book um, called El Norte that writes about the kind of the hidden history of Hispanic North America. And the title of our panel was um, Minorities in American History. And I wanted to say, wait a minute, like these are, <laughs> these are majority cultures. And so if you look hemispherically, these are these are majority cultures. So um, just to sort of shift our thinking to and to recognize that um, you know enslaved people, while they were absolutely denied rights um, and citizenship, um, in my view, they were Americans nonetheless who are shaping American history at every point. You know, they were there during the Continental Conventions. They were there during the Radio Declaration of Independence. They were there. They were living in Monticello. They were living at, at you know, at, at, with you know, one quarter of our presidents owned owned Amer other Americans. Many of them, by the way, were relatives, were kin, which is a whole other story of how interconnected this history is and how complicated it is. Um, so I just kind of put together the many stories and kind of layer them and build them together. Um, but it's it's a really complicated, and, and this is my main point. It's it's not meant to be. You know, American history is this or that, us or them. It's you know, it's it's both. We are we are we are you know, we come from slavery and we come from freedom. We are an Anglo and Latin, a white and black. You know, we are we are a complicated uh, nation, <laughs> to say the least. You have a, a quote that I'm just I was just trying to find and I couldn't find it, but I, but you you sort of got there just now too, which is this part about whether or not. The, their citizenship rights were recognized. These were American citizens. Oh, and well, I, 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 I want to say citizens in terms of they did their citizenship, right. their citizenship rights were not recognized right. um, over and over again. And, and, and it goes to, you know, and certainly at, and it goes state by state before the 14th Amendment. Um, but the 15th Amendment, it goes, you know, it contained, there's a lot of repression afterwards to prevent voting rights. So I want to be clear, I wasn't, you know, and I also want to be clear that, you know, these things, they change over time. So you can see how, you know, in earliest Virginia colony, um, some free men of African descent were able to vote, were able to do some things, were able to own um, other individuals. And then you could see the laws kind of closing down. This is an interesting thing about, about New World slavery also, is that the, the rights denied to enslaved people was extremely extreme. I mean, the idea of denying literacy, the idea of denying all these things, it's because as abolitionism is growing as a movement, right? And this discourse of rights is growing as a movement, people are tamping down on the rights of enslaved people. And that's, that becomes a really extreme, in my understanding, form of, of enslavement that's different from traditional slavery, but also the idea of denying rights to free people of color who during the time of slavery, right, who are, who are there's always free, free populations of color anywhere you have enslaved populations um, and to deny them rights, that, that's a kind of a new innovation in new world slavery. And then, um, as you know, you know, after emancipation, there was still denial of rights, right? So there's still, <laughs> you know, and, and, and in fact, there was like, you know, an incredible uptick of, of violence um, against uh, men and women of African descent um, throughout the entire nation um, that can, you know, persist to this day. So I, mean, I wanna be clear that, 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 you know, the rights were denied, um, opportunities were denied, educational access was denied, housing was denied. I mean, all these structural things are very, very, very real. That's why you can get to, here we are, however many years later, you know, the, the wealth gap is because of structural reasons 
you know, we have such an incredible disparity. That is, you know, how the, this system has never left us. It continues, obviously, in all these other, all these other ways. But my point is that you know, you look at you look at the the you know, we talk about like the South on the eve of the Civil War. I think people think about Gone with the Wind. You know, the majority of Southerners on the eve of the Civil War were African American. Period. Mm -hmm. Full stop. You know, and 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 you know, large majorities in certain places. And so in our, I feel like in our imaginations, we don't we don't recognize that sometimes um, that we've always um, been this multicultural nation, um, but we haven't told the story that way. And I think it'd be helpful to sort of, to, to recognize that we've really always been interconnected and to talk about, you know, the difficult parts and some of the heroic parts. And we had a really quick moment we talked about, I, I dropped a name, Mary Bowser, who was, um, who infiltrated the capital of Confederacy during the, the Civil War. And she feigned a dim wit and she had a photographic memory and she was a you know, observing everything that's happening around her, and she was feeding information to the white baker who was showing up at the front door with, or the back door with bread. Part of the spy ring, but the spy ring was made by um, a, a white Richmonder named Elizabeth Van Lu. In other words, you know, there was some interracial cooperation um, in many of these movements of the Underground Railroad of resisting um, the Confederacy. You know, white Southerners. That is also part of our story, and I think that we can, um, you know, celebrate and be proud of as we are clear-eyed about the incredible violence. Um, that we also um, created. And, and again, like th these aren't, you know, just people who are neighbors. These are often people who are relatives. I mean, when you go through the book, I, I always took care to say this person was, you know, the the son of an enslaved or, you know, or daughter of an enslaved woman and, you know, their owner. And that's true of Booker T. Washington. That's true of, you know, Mary Church Terrell, if I couldn't think of her name, that, that Alison mm -hmm. Harper was a fantastic book about, you know, and her, both of her parents were, um, people who were enslaved, who had been fathered by their owners, you know, un, un, you know, involuntary, involuntary unions. I mean, the list really, when you start to break it down, it's it's an incredible number of African Americans um, who whose parent was, you know, an enslaver, like the Thomas Jefferson story. But you could that's you know now James Monroe, George Washington had enslaved kin that weren't his biological kin. But I mean, Robert E. Lee's his wife. Her, she had two enslaved half sisters, right? Who, because her father and her sisters, um, had, that they, they were, they were all, the, all three daughters were fathered by George Washington's step grandson, if that makes any sense, Martha Washington's grandson. Um, and just when I read these stories, it just kind of floored me. You know, that we are all connected. Um, that you know, Robert E. Lee's de facto sisters-in-law were enslaved women. In other words, like we, it's you know. It's a it's a tragic history, but it's one that we're all connected in, um, and so I, I want to celebrate that 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 you know that we are we are all American in that way. And I would argue, actually, I would argue that you know all Americans are the descendants of slaves and slave owners, um, literally, and the people I'm talking about right now, but also figuratively, because we've all inherited the 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 landscape, the political, economic, cultural, psychological, and social landscape of the fallout from those interactions. Um, you know, familial violence, all that stuff. Um, we there's nothing I think that I can point to in our architecture, in our educational system, in the way we tell history um, that hasn't been shaped by that that history. You know, I wanted to, and um, I know we've got uh, Miss Vivian has a question, and we've got several others, but I wanted to quickly on that on that same topic of um, multiculturalism. Could you just share briefly this vignette about John Punch, President Obama? Miscegenation, children's law, sort of how all of that fits together. It really kind of, it's, it is like some, sort of a founding moment. So yeah, in, in graduate school, people were talking about, as I said, so the very beginning of the Virginia colony, the vast majority of, of Virginians were, were indentured servants from, from Europe um, who, who were you know, unfree for a period of like three to seven years. It's very, very different from enslavement, but it's still, an, um, this, this is why I was saying most people were unfree. Um, and also there were, you know, in, in the beginning, you know, a small number of, of enslaved um, Africans were intercepted from the trade that was burgeoning, right, in the rest of, of the Americas and Spanish America, Portuguese America. And um, so people were trying to look at when the laws kind of start to crystallize. By 1705, the, law, the laws are really going to crystallize and say people of African descent are going to be enslaved. The children of these women are going to be enslaved in perpetuity. And, and, and really, you know, start to draw this line. But it's there's some fuzzy areas in the early 1600s. And John Punch was um, an African descended 
servant who ran away with two European descended servants. And they were recovered and they were tried in Virginia. And the European servants were sentenced with additional years of service. And John Punch was, was punished with service for life. And so some scholars will say, well, this is, this is the moment, right? This is the moment. This is the beginning of this permanent uh, uh, enslavement for people of African descent. But John Punch has a child with a European woman indentured servant and their, their children, she passes on her free status and her white racial status to her, to the children. Um, and it has been determined, it's been suggested by, by genealogists at ancestry.com that President Barack Obama was the 11th great grandson of John Punch. And so obviously his father is from Kenya. So this is not the line through his father. This is the line of his white mother from Kansas. Mm -hmm. um, so the fact that the idea that the first African-American president of the United States could descend from the first African-American slave in the United States through his mother, you know, through his white maternal line really to me kind of speaks to how complicated this history is. That It's not as simple as I think we've kind of made it out to be that we really are all in, all connected in the story. And by the way, so the, the punches um, go on to pass as white uh, for generations on, but the bunches, um, this, the family kind of bifurcates, the bunches who moved to North Carolina identify as people of color and they continue to marry people of color. And the, um, one of those um, uh, people, that family, it was Ralph Bunch, who was um, the first African-American to win the Nobel Peace Prize in 1950, I think it was, who's a political scientist and a brilliant diplomat. Um, so there's two there's two political figures who, who came from this this line, but you can do this over and over again. Like people talking about you know descendants from from the enslaved um, families at Monticello. Some of them fought in colored like USCT colored units in the in the Civil War. Some of them fought in white units. And so to, that's another example that kind of encapsulates for me. You know this is this is a complicated history of multiculturalism of, of how people you know many people had multiple ancestries and then we sort of forced this very violent color line to sift people onto one side or other of, of that line through, like, as I said, you know, through, through, through violence, um, through that's both ideological and, and, you know, spatial, physical and, and literal as well. Well, oh, I have so many questions, but let's in fairness, let's get to the three of the questions. And if there's time, because I do want to explore this blackness and whiteness and how our Latin American, mm -hmm. you know, how, how they have thread that needle, threaded that mm -hmm. needle. So, um, I think Ms. Vivian asked, how long did it take your read? How long did your research take? Oh my gosh. I mean, like I said, this is, I'm really standing on, on the shoulders of these, of these scholars that preceded me. And so, and I was, so I was teaching school and I was, you know, doing research. And so, I mean, it, it took a good, a good 10 years, but a, a lot of it was, you know, it's just, it's just kind of what I do when I'm interested in it. And I can, I keep doing it. <laughs> in other words, it's not for me, it's not a finite project. It's, it's kind of an everyday thing. Um, uh, to investigate, but it took it took a it took a long time. So in other words, I mean, some of it stuff it's really outdated. Like I said, people have recently produced really fantastic scholarship on this history and these individuals. Um, I actually put up some of the books behind me to, to you know kind of give little shout outs. That that's just extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Awesome. We have, Kyla, yeah, oh, yeah. So we have a question actually from someone who um, is originally from Savannah. And so they were hoping that you could go into more detail about someone that they had never before heard of, which is the um, Haitian Revolution that you mentioned in Savannah. Like, can you talk about that? Yes. Um, so, I mean, as you might recall, you know, the French were very much supporting, you know, I re referenced General Lafayette. The French were where some people would say, you know, instrumental in, in the American victory uh, during the American Revolution. You know, the, the French were happy to fight it, you know, to be opposed to the British. Um, so uh, among the French forces that were, you know, boots on the ground in Savannah was a volunteer um, Afro-Haitian um, unit um, and as I said, I mean, there's there you can see throughout the Americas there are always men of African descent in in militias. I mean, it, and it's certainly, especially in majority black um, colonies, that becomes a sort of stopgap, if you will. That becomes extremely important to trying to maintain order and maintain um, control in those colonies. But but. Um, Black men were absolutely essential in these wars, but, but the Haitian Revolution itself, I just want to point out, was you know such an extraordinary event, and people, Marlene Doubt and, and Laurent Dubois write about this, and they were such huge inspirations for, for my thinking about this, in terms of thinking about people of African descent as shaping this discourse of citizenship and forcing sort of, you know, the, to make it 
real, to make it, to make, you know, egalitarianism real, you know. And so um, it was such a seminal moment in the history of the West, this idea of overturning slavery, defeating Napoleon, and really, this is the first state in the new world to end slavery. Um, so this is the first nation in the new world that puts these ideals into practice. Um, so it is such an important moment in the whole history of freedom, the history of citizenship. And then, you know, it's, it has such a huge impact on the United States again, because you have lots of people coming from Haiti who are settling um, during and after the Haitian Revolution in New Orleans, in Virginia, in New York. And so, for example, in the War of 1812, Andrew Jackson enlisted many Afro-Haitian soldiers and officers to help win that battle, and also African-American soldiers helped for that battle of New Orleans that, that, they, that they won. Um, and also just really quickly, you know, Charles Reason was, was a, 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 a descendant of, of, of Haitian parents who lived in New York, and he becomes the first black professor at a predominantly white college in like 1850. He was, he was a brilliant math genius. Um, so he was, you know, one of, one of the first, as I said, the first uh, black professor in a predominantly white college. So this history of Haiti is very much interconnected um, with freedom struggles in the new world. And you can see, you know, newspapers in Richmond complaining like, oh, you know, people like, like Gabriel Prosser and other, you know, African-Americans are reading and, you know, they, they're, they're reading about this information. I think I have back here, The Common Wind, um, such an important book, talking about how the word of the success of the Haitian uh, revolution was, it really infiltrates every part of the Americas, um, especially the US, and really starts to initiate this period of, I mean, and we'll go on, but like you can see in the book, in 1795, I mean, there's just gazillions of these uprisings for freedom from New Orleans to Curacao to Cuba, I mean, you name it, but that it's, you know, it's almost a, a contagion of liberty, if you will. Mm -hmm. Love it. Um, Olivia, did you have another question or was that the one from Miss Vivian? That was that was Miss Vivian's question. Thank you. Our, oh, uh, our, our uh, number one fan. Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, well, then maybe Dr. Proenza Coles, you could talk about the Latin American concept of whiteness, blackness, and how they sort of navigate something that we in this country would never even think with our one eighth rule or whatever it is, if, you know. Right. <laughs> well, as I, I mean, as I said, you know, the, the, you know, slavery didn't have anything to do with race in previous epics, but it's here in the new world that you can start to see, and I actually did my dissertation on this. I looked at how um, people in colonial Virginia, how they classified mixed race children, um, and how they how they racially sort of defined workers, as I said, kind of pulled apart. I mean, there's this really quickly, you know, there's Bacon's Rebellion in Virginia in 17, 1676, where where um, black and white enslaved uh, and servant people came together and rose up against the colonial state. And so there's this old argument by Edmund Morgan that you know people try to really separate this color line um, to be clear, like who are going to be free workers and who are going to be unfree workers. Well, in Latin America. Things are very different um, during the colonial period in terms of how they classify mixed race children. And there's also not a big gigantic population of European indentured servants in Latin America. Um, and you get this much more porous definition of whiteness. And my understanding is that, you know, in Virginia and what becomes the rest of the United States, it's it's sort of the most extreme, um, as you said, you know, how you get to a one drop roll. That, 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 doesn't, that does not happen until the 19th century, I believe, um, maybe even the earliest 20th century. So you can sort of see these things evolve. And, they and again, I should say, like, anything you can imagine, you know, in history happened. The worst things, the craziest things, the, the you know, good things. But, like, some things, you know, change, uh, you know, are site-specific in, you know, uh, in different communities. But in broadly speaking, there's no other country in the world that has kind of one drop rule. In fact, there was this, I don't know if it's a true story, but a story about um, a, a U.S. journalist interviewing um, – uh, Haitian President Duvalier in more recent times and saying, what, what percentage of your population is um, white? And he said, 99%. And she said, I think you misunderstood the question. And he said, what do you mean? He said, you have your one drop rule, so do we. Um, it's really makes clear how kind of absurd the one drop rule was. And you can see also, you know, if you do the whole all the American founders portraits, I've got 300 portraits I invite people to check out on, on Instagram. So I can do a little vignettes about them. I mean, I think a lot of those individuals might have been considered, you know, um, in a different racial category in Latin America, which Latin America had to, certainly had many more gradations. Don't get me wrong, white, Latin America had a white supremacist attitude, racial violence, a lot of anti-blackness, but the way that they conceptualized who was what um, was very different because it just, it was a, it was a, it's a more, um, 
more inclusive understanding of whiteness. It's still privileging whiteness, but there's more kind of um, wiggle room for um, people's um, class status, their education, their comportment, their reputation, um, character becomes this kind of big catchword um, for for uh, and proxy for kind of racial status. So again, I'm not. I wouldn't argue that there's less racism in Latin America, but I would argue there's a more fluid definition of people who who, consider, who do consider themselves white um, or could be considered considered white. And I'm really, for me, it was important about us to realize the whole thing is a fiction, right? I mean, in, the, in those early um, things of Virginia, they were talking about Christian servants, English servants. I mean, this, this, nobody even called themselves white until 1670 or something. Um, and, you can, and same in Latin America, they referred to themselves as Spanish, as Christians. And so this idea there's white people, that's a brand new thing that comes out of this whole crazy system. And I think, and I would argue that the, the notion of white people is part of this trying to, trying to, Come to terms with the contradictions of slavery and democracy that are here. You know, you can't resolve those contradictions, but it becomes a way to try to create distance um, from other communities. Of you know, these communities can be denied rights, but whiteness becomes this kind of proxy for citizenship. Um, that is that is malleable. That's what they want to say. It's not biological. It's political. It's a political tool. It's cultural. It's social. It changes over time. Um, it's really quickly, if I have time, super quick. There was this case where. Um, some orphans, Irish orphans, were placed with um, Mexican families in Arizona territory in the late 1800s, early 1900s, which the New Yorkers thought was just fine. Catholics could go to the Catholics. Well, the Anglo settlers in, 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 the t in Arizona said, no way, no way can you have these, you know, white orphans with these Latin, Latin you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have said Latin next thing, but, you know, Hispanic Catholics. And literally vigilantes broke into homes and took the kids and you know, a court ruled that was okay. But it was, just, it was just to say that like in New York, it wasn't seen as like a racial issue. In fact, Irish weren't even seen as quite white at that period of time. So it seemed fine to put them with the Mexican families, but it read something, it meant something different in Arizona in the early 1900s, which again is to say that this whiteness, it's a, it's a political tool. Fascinating. Yeah, that's, that's one of the things that well, I learned many things, but one of the things I learned in the book was this sort of construct of race and and the and the falseness of it really and yeah um and so i wanted to ask the question and that is based on your book everything that we learned there are so many gems you know gems that you know this little and you you know you can just you know my mind is still processing in ways but i want to in essence, sort of give a call to action. I want to, you know, any words of advice. So given our, our new awakening, our new social awakening, this newness that many of us, this journey that we're on of discovery and really trying to, you know, to figure out that the ground has kind of shifted, right? What we thought was truth, in fact, is a complete fabrication, right? And, and re relearning the truth. What words of wisdom, encouragement, and then call for action would you give those that are in this journey or deciding whether to join the journey? I mean, I think, you no know, one thing that's very important, and as I said, American Founders really celebrates the best of our American history, the best of our American values, and it really highlights how men and women of African descent were instrumental in instituting and supporting and championing and fighting for the best of our American values. As I said, I didn't focus as much on the incredible violence that our history has also um, encompassed. And I think it's really important that we are open to it and, uh, and understand really just how much violence has gone into, um, you know, just speaking of Savannah, you know, that there's, 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 you know, there's the weeping time was one of the largest, you know, slave market uh, sales in history. You could walk down the streets of, of in Charleston and see the, the handprints um, made by you know, enslaved children who are making the bricks. And so just to kind of recognize that all around us, we're part of this history of, of slavery um, that we need to come to terms with. But what I will say is that we're really deeply, we're, we're connected by this history. And I really urge not to think about things about us versus them, and, and um, but to really recognize that we share this history. This is something, this is what makes us American is that we're all part of the story and there's a place for all of us in it. You know, I've met people who are like, oh, I feel so guilty or I feel this and that. I mean, we just, we just need to recognize where we come from, where we came from. We have a lot of fantastic, um, uh, you know, uh, heroes that we could look to, 
um, in the past. Um, although it's a complicated past, not, not everybody in my book is a hero, by the way. I mean, it's a mm -hmm. more complicated, they just are. Yeah. Yeah. But to recognize that, you know, we can really, I think, I think that we can focus on the best, we can recognize the worst of our past and, and to understand it and to, you know, take stock of it. But we can also celebrate the best of these traditions that really bring us all together um, and can really unite us in, in the future. Mm, that's beautiful. So please, everyone, go out and buy or go to the library, but this is a must read. It's a must yeah. read. It's a reference book because you're going to turn time and time and again to look at, you know, it's, as she said, it's chock full. Look at that. It's mm -hmm. chock full of story after story after story. It is full. So thank you, Dr. Christina Proenza Coles, for joining us in this discussion. We could have talked, Kyla and I, mm -hmm. with you for another two hours and still oh, yeah. Really yeah. just touch the surface of your book. So yeah. thank you for your incredible work. Thank you for spending this time with us. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Pronza Coles. I wanted to extend a thank you from the library side as well. It's truly illuminating and really challenges the um, uh, the the two dimensional uh, approach to race in this country, um, both now and in history. And um, really excited that we have this book and we can share it. Um, I also wanted to uh, to echo what. Uh, Renee Battlebrook said that you can purchase this book from our partners loyalty bookstores at tinyurl.com slash PGC MLS loyalty. You can also learn more about it at American Founders Book. Um, we also recommend that you follow Dr. Proenza Coles on Twitter at Proenza Coles. And if you want to see more pictures um, from history and hear more about the uh, enlightening and setting stories behind them, you can follow Dr. Proenza Coles at Instagram.com slash Proenza Coles. That's P R O E N Z A C O L E S. Uh, again, I wanted to thank you. And we're always thrilled to have these events with our friends at the OHR. If you want to see more events that are coming, um, coming up, we have a lot of really exciting things going on for Pride Month and Juneteenth at the library. Visit pgcmls.info slash events to see more events for all ages or tinyurl.com slash pgchrc events for the events that we're hosting with our, our pals here. Just want to shout out a couple before we go. On uh, June 9th, which is this Wednesday, we have Lenny Duncan uh, speaking about his book, United States of Grace, with uh, guest host Teddy Reeves. That's at 7 p.m. On Monday, June 16th, Dwayne Ratliff will be talking about his book, Dancing to the Lyrics, which we're very excited about. And uh, on the last Tuesday of every month, June 29th, uh, we have The Elephant We Don't See, The Diversity Dialogue, and we will be discussing Cooper Lee Bombardier's memoir, Pass With Care. And Kyla's showing that there, and uh, she and I will be discussing that with Michelle uh, Heniel, who is... Um, uh, my colleague at the library. So we're very excited for that. Again, thank you so much for being with us tonight. We could have listened all evening and um, be excited to return to this conversation again and again. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.